Another fantastic episode of Movie Battleground. We have some amazing competitors here today. I am looking forward to this fight. Uh, I'm in a very awkward position because these guys are both top contenders in this league. These are some fantastic fighters, and I can't wait to see them do what they do best, and that's debate movies. I am Robert the Hobbit Parker here. And on behalf of all the Movie Battleground admins, I'd just like to thank you for tuning in. And we'll do a quick introduction of our fighters today. First up, we have Isaac Horvat. How you doing, Isaac? Good. Ready to get ready to get some uh, arguments started. And uh, yeah, feeling good. For sure, for sure. It's good to see you here. And of course, we also have Jeremy Adams. How you doing, Jeremy? Doing good. Excited to be here. Always happy to to talk about movies in a very heated manner. <laughs> of course, of course. So for those of you watching along at home who may not know how this works, uh, I'm going to be the judge of these matches. We have these questions separated out. Um, these guys are going to be debating their options. We're going to have opening arguments, a little bit of an open forum in the middle, and then closing arguments. I'll be judging based off of how they support their own argument, as well as how they attack and counterattack their opponent's argument. So it's not just about how you can support your own, it's also how you truly play the game of debating. So, that being said, let's get into the first question, and already it's one of my favorite that I've ever had the pleasure of hosting. Um, here goes. Question one. Which MCU character would serve as the best host for the Oscars? Which MCU character would serve as the best host for the Oscars? Uh, if it's all right, I think we're going to start with Jeremy on this one. So, Jeremy, take it away with your opening argument whenever you're ready. All right. Well, for me, I think there's really only one answer there's certainly only one that that i really think fits and that is the man tony stark or iron man and there's a couple reasons for this for one the oscars really kind of fits in with with our all, what we know of tony and his background tony is a guy who is he's a mover and a shaker he works with the big wigs and in different industries and corporations and certainly he would have uh, brushed shoulders with a lot of la people a lot of hollywood people uh, a lot of uh, what goes on at the oscars is involved with corporations and things so he knows people and the other thing with iron man is he's a little older he's he's very uh, a slick and the oscars is an older group this is a lot of older people um this is a industry that it can be a little stodgy a little older and tony he he knows how to talk to these people you know he he knows the way that his dad uh howard stark you know would deal with people back in you know he probably knew howard hughes and people like that so he he knows this arena he knows this crowd he would be able to tell the right jokes he would be able to mention the right names he would know who to talk to in the audience and then just god think about the opening that Tony Stark could do with all of his gadgets, his technology, the Iron Man suits flying around, different superheroes showing up. I mean, Tony's got all the connections. He knows all the superheroes too, as well as all the, the corporate big wigs. He knows everybody. I mean, there really is, I, it like Tony Stark for me is the ultimate Oscar host. And that includes like real life as well as Marvel. All right, certainly a strong opening from Jeremy. We're gonna hop it on over to Isaac for your opening argument. Take it away, Isaac. Okay, the the uh, the character that I chose that would be the best Oscar host is Peter Quill from Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, uh, three things that he said in his opening fits into the back fits into Tony Stark's background, and he he's a mover and a shaker, and he knows all these people, and he has all these connections. Just because you're friends with people in that industry doesn't make you a good choice for a host. Um, yes, the Oscars are old, and he's old. That's part of the problem. The ratings are going down. We need somebody new. We need somebody fresh. That's Peter Quill. Uh, and the question isn't what would be the most realistic to host the Oscars. It's what would be the best host as an as an individual. Tony Stark, yeah, he's got gadgets and gizmos aplenty, like, like the Little Mermaid. Peter Quill has the Guardians of the Galaxy in his back pocket. Nobody wants to see one of 50 Iron Man suits on stage. They want to see a talking raccoon and a tree or aliens. That's what would make this Peter Quill the perfect choice of the hoster. It's what he brings as a host. He's funny. Uh, he's entertaining and he would be genuinely excited to be there. All righty. I'm just finishing up my notes there. So for the first question, we do a six minute open forum. This is kind of you guys talking, debating, monologuing, whatever you really like. Uh, just keep it to the argument. And this is where you can get the bulk of your argument in. Uh, whoever wants to start talking, I will start the clock when you start. 
All right. Uh, I'm going to give you two examples of two hosts that we've had that I think are very much symbolized by these two guys. One of them is Billy Crystal, who is a guy who is, he tells a lot of jokes. He entertains people. He's that old timey. He, he hosted like seven times and had high ratings and people loved him. The other host I'm going to throw out there is Seth MacFarlane. Seth MacFarlane is younger, hipper, is in touch with the kids, and he bombed horribly because he's up there trying to, to do segments about boobs and stuff. Now, Pierre Quill, he's a younger guy. He's got a different sense of humor. He's going to be telling Jackson Pollock cum jokes. He's going to be, you know, bringing Rocket out there. He's probably going to try to kill people. He is not in touch with the Oscar crowd. And, yeah, maybe they're old, maybe they're stodgy, but they are what they are. And if you get somebody like Peter Quill, like they did with Seth MacFarlane or James Franco and try to hip it up, it goes really wrong. you got to get the guy who knows how to handle the crowd, who knows how to tell the jokes, who is in touch, or it just turns into a disaster. You try to hip it up, it goes wrong. You're not wrong about uh, uh, James Franco and uh, uh, Billy Crystal. You're not wrong, okay? Seth MacFarlane, I, I actually love his hosting at the Oscars. I thought, except for one or two moments, it worked very well. Um, speaking of uh, people who make good hosts, Hugh Jackman makes a great host. He was young. He was hip. He can sing and dance. And and that, Hugh Jackman is not young and <laughs> he was when he hosted. He was when he hosted, and Ooh. the singing and dancing is a part of the show. What are the Oscars? It's a ceremony. It can be boring. You need somebody there that can liven it up. Peter Quill. We've seen it again and again. He loves to dance. He loves to sing, uh, and that is where he definitely has an edge over Tony. Okay, Peter Quill. His he's been off Earth for so many years. What are all of his references going to be? They're all going to be '80s references that aren't going to play with people. He's not in touch with the new movies. He doesn't know any of the actors. And what's going to happen if Gamora, Gamora Drax, Rocket, and uh, Groot are on that stage? They're, you think they're going to want to stand on that stage and perform? No. These are the guard. They are killers. They're they're mercenaries. They don't want to be there. They're going to start. Somebody's going to look at them wrong, and they're going to start blasting people in the crowd. It, Tony Stark's a performer. This is what he does. He woos people. He gets people's appreciation. He gets people's support for everything that he does. This is his arena. That he is a mover and shaker. The Guardians are going to cause havoc. And Seth MacFarlane, you may have liked him, but he bombed in that room, man. Those young hip guys, it does not go over. Okay, one thing. Yes, of course the 80s jokes are going to land. 80s nostalgia is high, at a higher level than it has ever been before. If there was ever a time for an 80s nostalgic host, it's now. How As many, the Guardians how many Gal 80s movies no. are nominated for Best Picture? How many 80s it, movies have acting nominations? He's going to be totally out of touch. He's not going to know anything that's going on. He's, he's been gone from Earth. He doesn't know what's going on on Earth. You're going to pluck him down there with the, the Guardians. Excitement. It's going to be a shit show. I said the Guardians. No, no, no. It's not. I didn't answer the Guardians. I said the Guardians would be there great as like a bit part, a small part of the I'm not saying they're going to be there hosting the whole show. As for Tony Stark as a showman, yeah, you know what he used to be as a showman? A gun salesman. How is a, how is a former weapons <laughs> dealer going to play in liberal Hollywood, especially in the time we're living with all these mass shootings? I don't think we want a weapons dealer on stage. That's who Tony Stark is. You know who the Oscars now embraced? Mel Gibson. I think the Oscars can forgive people. It's funny, but in today's world, racism is easier excused than than uh, believing in hey, guns. And we're looking, we're looking at the universe of the movie. In the universe of the movie, Tony Stark <laughs> is celebrated now. He, he, is, he is celebrated as a protector. Yes, he had a questionable past and he has his detractors, but people love him and he's a hero and that's going to play in the room. The, the, he, the Hollywood is all about the heroes. They're all about taking these American heroic ideas and holding them up. Tony now symbolizes all of that. He symbolizes everything that Hollywood stands for. Yeah, the, what are the Guardians going to do? They're going to show up for one minute, look around and then leave? Or are you going to try to get them to perform? I don't know what you're doing with the Guardians. They don't fit at all. It's a terrible idea to bring them there. Oh, come on. One bit part of having Groot and, like, Drax try to present an award, that's going to go over, like, gangbusters. That's hilarious. Peter Quill, come on. This is, they're this not, they're not going to like it. Here's, here's Rock, the other thing about Tony not Stark. Gonna stand for that. Here's the other thing about Tony Stark. He's mean. He's, he's not going to play well to the crowd. He's going to be nasty and go after people on a personal level, and it's he's going gonna, to be awkward. 
he's going to know his limits. He's going to know how to tell those witty quips, put people down, but not take it too far. This is a guy that's been glad handing to get contracts, to get support for years and years. He was taught all of this by his father, Howard Stark, who was a mover and shaker back in Hollywood and in, in U the U.S. back in the old days. He knows exactly how to play it. Peter is totally out mm -hmm. of touch. He hasn't been on Earth and he doesn't know what he's doing. It would be a disaster. Be James Franco all over again. When is Peter Quill hosting these Oscars? Because he's about to come to Earth in an Infinity War. Yeah. Yeah, what, he gets here, and then well, he's got like five minutes to prep for the Oscars. I mean, Tony's been prepping for this his whole life. This also, is what he does. a fun little loophole. Who says that he has to host the current Oscars? <laughs> the Oscars really haven't changed much. The Oscars are, they're always been what they are. Exactly. But, they know. haven't changed much. And Tony Stark is more of the same while Peter Quill is something new and interesting. Even if he might not have seen every movie you, that you, year, you that's can't... part of the fun. Imagine, a, imagine, imagine him being up there completely lost on stage trying to guess what these movies are he, about Peter and Quill, making old references. Peter Quill would play great on the uh, MTV Movie Awards or on the... the the Teen Choice Awards. He'd play great there. The Oscars are different. The Oscars are held to a different standard, and it has not changed in over 70 years. The Oscars are what they are, and you can't bring that kind of anarchy into it. It just and doesn't time play. time right there. I'm going to have to call time there. All right, so we're going to go back to Jeremy for his closing argument. Just a reminder that closing arguments are meant to sum up all of your points for your movie and to sum up all of the points you've already made against the other movie. Uh, Jeremy, with your closing argument, whenever you're ready. Look, every time that I come on Movie Battleground, I have to talk about the Oscars. Now, look, <laughs> I like the Oscars. The Oscars are fun, but the Oscars are what they are. They don't give awards to the best movies. They give awards to the movies that are safe, that play with, with them. And they don't want the cool, young, hip guy that's going to bring murdering animals on stage that are unpredictable. And who knows what the hell Drax is going to do? Who knows what Gamora is going to do? Maybe a nebula is going to chase her there. This is not what the Oscars are. It's not what they've ever been. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe I don't like it. But the Oscars are what they are. And Tony Stark is the man for the Oscars. He's going to play in that room. He's going to play to that crowd. And I personally would love from home to watch Tony Stark host the Oscars. And I honestly would rather watch all of his technology and stuff than Raccoon get up there and start shooting at people because somebody looks at him the wrong way. I think that would be kind of horrible. All right. A very solid closing from Jeremy. And we'll throw it over to Isaac for your closing statement. Okay. Tony Stark, uh, he's not. He wouldn't be a good host. He can't sing. He can't dance. He'd be bored by the whole thing. This is this is one of the key things. Tony, Peter Quill, even if he might not have everything going for him in that moment, as far as knowing all the knowledge, he would be genuinely excited to be there. He loves pop culture. He loves the references. He loves movies. He would be excited to be there. Tony Stark would be that meme of him sitting there rolling his eyes. He, he wouldn't be interested. And as for having dangerous things on stage, uh, Nebula is part of the Guardians now. Uh, they're, being, they're reformed as a group of, group of ragtag fun ruffians. Tony Stark would invent some kind of technology to show in his opening act that would turn into Ultron and kill anyone, everyone. Like, it's it's an obvious choice here. Peter Quill is the much better host. Tony Stark, not so much. Oh my gosh! Coming out of the gate swing, you guys are not taking it easy on me. Um, oh my gosh! Give me a second to wrap up all my thoughts. I have extensive notes on every. My, my hand could only move. You always so fast. take a lot. You always take a lot of notes, Robert. I do. I do. <laughs> I want to. I want to be as in depth as possible. All right. So, I think. You guys are both great fighters. That's very, very clear. Uh, you guys both made a lot of fantastic points. Really, you did. Um, I have a few fact-checking things. Uh, Billy okay. Crystal hosted the Oscars eight times. Mm -hmm. He was topped only by Bob Hope, who hosted 18 times. So just a little tidbit there. And Hugh Jackman was 41 when he hosted. Um, so as far as him being hip and relatable at 41, that's uh, open to interpretation for sure. Um so for this one, I loved what Isaac was saying about how 80s nostalgia is working now. He can sing and dance. It'd be funny to see him guessing the references. Uh, he had a great a lot. He had a lot of great hits against uh, Iron Man as far as he's going to create Ultron and everybody's going to die and he's not going to like being there. But I think the point that really, really hit it home for Jeremy is that the Oscars are what they are. 
uh, they aren't going to want somebody, somebody like Peter Quill isn't going to go over well. Uh, you know, they, they take themselves very seriously. That's the argument that Jeremy was going for, and that really hit it home for me. They're not going to like somebody like Peter Quill there, whereas Iron Man, who's been around the business since his father, he learned from his father. I think that was the point that really hit it home for me. So I'm going to give this first point by just the slightest of margins to Jeremy. Well, Great job, Isaac. Yeah, Great good job, job Isaac. <laughs> I originally picked Tony Stark, so I know you beat me to it. <laughs> hey, Star Lord would have been my number two as well. <laughs> All right. Just getting my notebook reset for the next page. As we go into round two, question two of this amazing fight, already off to the races, and it's not going to slow down anytime soon. Um, for this one, you guys are going to have a little bit longer on your opening arguments just because it is a pitch question. So question two is going to be, pitch the next movie that Kevin Hart and Dwayne Johnson are going to star in. So you guys are going to have to pitch the next Dwayne Johnson, Kevin Hart team-up movie. Uh, we started with Jeremy last time, so we're going to go to Isaac to start this time. Take it away, Isaac. Okay. <clears throat> pitch a movie. This is going to be fun. I actually uh, chose not to do a remake or, or a spinoff or anything like that. I'm going with an original project. It's a very serious drama called Spring Butterfly. Um, now, I'll, I'll explain the reference because it, it, a butterfly is a wrestling move, and I use yeah. spring for kind of different reasons. One, to get out of it, and one as spring is kind of the time of year where things come out and a change happens, right? So... Basic plot line here. Uh, an aging wrestler, played by Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson, of course, su sustains an unintentional accidental injury in the ring while performing. Um, in, after the accident, he's in a dark place. In his frustration, uh, an interaction with a fan goes bad. He, uh, he uh, flips out, uh, being depressed by the potentially career-ending injury. He gets into the altercation and is sentenced to community service and anger management therapy. Now, this is where Kevin Hart comes in. He plays this therapist who used to be a college basketball star, got injured, and turned as a healer. Um, he uh, takes Dwayne Johnson in, helps him grow as a person, and pushes him into a new career as an actor. And they help each other uh, kind of learn and grow as people. Um, the movie ends with the uh, wrestler, Dwayne Johnson, uh, getting a small bit part in a play or a uh, TV series and it being a success and the the therapist thinks that he's kind of been forgotten, but no, he comes back and they go out together for drinks. He hasn't forgotten who put him there um, and he ends up as a better person. It's uh, then that is Spring Butterfly. Awesome, awesome. So definitely an in-depth, creative move there. Uh, quick question, Isaac, what genre is this? You didn't really specify and just... Uh, drama. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, and we will now pass it over to Jeremy for his pitch. Okay, well, I did go for a remake. Um, when the first thing I thought of when I thought of The Rock and Kevin Hart is I thought, okay, they, these guys are a great team. They're, they're, they work well together. They have chemistry. So I immediately started thinking back to past uh, movie teams, and my mind immediately went to Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor, who had multiple films together, and I think their most unsung masterpiece, the first film that they did together, was called Silver Streak. It came out in 1976, and it's a wonderful mix of comedy and uh, uh, thriller, Hitchcock thriller. It's, a, it's very much Hitchcock-inspired, and the story was uh, Gene Wilder's on a train going cross-country, and he gets involved in a spy plot, and people are trying to kill him, and then he teams up with Richard Pryor, who's like a, a hustler who helps him uh, evade the authorities and stuff and, and get a little more streetwise. So it was a very fun, great movie from the 70s. Well, I thought this was a good movie, uh, kind of a forgotten movie with this great team, but let's, let's see. This, this, I think we could do this. We could, we could update this, and we could come up with something that really plays to the strengths of these two actors in a very different way. And I thought I'd, I would flip it a little bit by putting Kevin Hart in the Gene Wilder role. So in my version, G Kevin Hart is this kind of neurotic guy he doesn't really like to fly and stuff, so he decides to, to – he's just had a divorce, and he decides to take this cross-country trip on a train. It's a, it's a technological train that's going all the way across the country. He meets a young woman played by Zoe Kravitz on the train. They have a nice little um, uh, thing here. Um, now, 
at this point, I was thinking of the original movie. There's a great villain played by Patrick McGowan, who you might know from Braveheart. Very, very imposing great villain in the original movie. So I'm thinking, who can show up on this train as the villain? And I had this epiphany. Somebody just said that they're going to stop doing action. They're retiring from action movies. Let's have them go out do their last action movie with a little bit of a twist playing the villain, and that's Liam Neeson basically playing his Taken character, but he's a, he's a bad version of the Taken character. He's somebody who is after a target. Kevin Hart gets in his way. Kevin Hart sees something he's not supposed to see, and now for the rest of the movie, Taken Liam Neeson is trying to take out Kevin Hart. So he Kevin Hart at some point has to get off the train. He's trying to escape, and he's mugged by this, this uh, gangster on the street who's played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Now, this is a little different than what we've seen Dwayne do different. He's the streetwise, kind of like tough, thuggish guy, kind of like the movie he made, Snitch. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different take for him. It's kind of, you know, not what you would expect, especially coming off Central Intelligence, to basically see him kind of play a, a thuggish, cholo kind of guy. But Kevin Hart basically bribes him, promises him all this money if he'll protect him. So it's Kevin Hart on the run with Dwayne The Rock Johnson as a thug, outsmarting the spies, running from the police, who are now out after Kevin Hart. And Kevin just wants to get back to this wonderful woman that he met on this train. And, you know, at the same time, he's having adventures he's never had before because he's always played it safe. It'll be fun. It'll be entertaining. It'll be a little bit of a throwback. There'll be a lot of Hitchcock references. But at the same time, it's going to be funny and, and romantic and all these different things. And, oh, my God, to see Liam Neeson go up against Cholo Rock, I think that'd be really fun and entertaining. All right, so definitely two unorthodox picks, I would say. Definitely not probably the first things that come to most people's minds, but creative <laughs> nonetheless. I love all the different casting. I love all the ways that these things are going to work together. So we're supposed to have about five minutes of an open forum. Because it is a pitch round, I'm going to be a little bit lenient on the time because you guys are going to have to go a little bit more in depth. Uh, but whenever the first person starts talking, I'll start the clock. Okay, well, start the clock then, because um, <laughs> Silver Streak, okay, you said it at the beginning, remake, like, and I don't want to say, like, immediately negative things about remakes, because, you know, sometimes they work. Most of the time, they don't. Um, you said something interesting in your opening argument that I thought was funny about flipping the script and making it different. Um, it feels like a lot of the same. Neurotic Kevin Hart. Uh, Dwayne Johnson playing this imposing uh, thug like in Snitch or Pain and Gain, um, and a comedy thriller uh, where Kevin Hart plays this guy in over his head while zany things happen around him. That sounds like Central Intelligence. Sounds like Ride Along. Uh, it, it sounds like all the buddy cop movies that have been the same. I really wanted to flip the script and give them something dramatic, something that will stretch them, something that will undercut audience expectations. I, I know Dwayne Johnson has dramatic roles. We've seen it before. Kevin Hart, I think, has been playing it safe with these comedic roles, doing his little shtick for way too long. He's got a serious side to him. You've seen it in his interviews, and you've seen it in his stand-up, in his book. He's got an edge to him that he hasn't tapped into, and I want to see that side of them. I want to see something real, and, and that's what I give them with Spring Butterfly. All right. Well, what you hit me, what you hit me with was the this can go wrong argument with, yeah, a lot of remakes haven't been good. Well, I'm going to hit you with the same argument. There's a lot of movies where you take comedic actors like, say, Adam Sandler and people like that, and they try to do more dramatic roles. And often, uh, just recently, we had Eddie Murphy. I'm trying to remember the name of that movie. Mr. Something. Ah, anyway, like sometimes they, these, these comedic actors who we love in certain ways try to go out of their comfort zone and make these movies, and sometimes it goes really wrong, and I see a lot of potential for wrong in yours because they're out of their comfort zones. They're trying to be dramatic. It's kind of the, you know, you said my movie is a remake. It's the same stuff we've already seen. Well, I've seen your movie seven million times before. It's the guy screws up meets another guy, they get, they befriend each other, then the guy gets a second chance at a new career, the one friend feels left out, and then they come back together. I've seen that same arc over and over and over again, 
And it just, it can play schmaltzy and it can play like Oscar baiting when you get two actors that aren't known for dramatic roles trying to play these kind of roles. It can go really wrong. My movie, yeah, there's a lot of familiarity there, but that's good. That's going to sell a movie. If somebody in Hollywood's going to hear that premise and say, yeah, this is probably going to sell. And then you can get a talented filmmaker like, say, Antoine Fuqua in there who hasn't really had a chance to do as much comedy, who can bring his, his action chops in, it can bring his thriller chops in, and they can bring something new to something that is a little bit familiar, but at the same time, it is different. It's Hitchcock. And The Rock, he's played tough roles before, but not, in the, not with... Uh, Kevin Hart and not in this arena. It's different than what he did in Central Intelligence. It's different than his kind of dummy character in Pain and Gain. I think it'll be a lot of fun and you want the familiar, you want fun. And your movie might end up just being a sap fest. I honestly, I've seen it before and I don't know what, what I'm getting from it. Yeah, we have seen it before. We've seen it in Jim Carrey, in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, or you brought up Adam Sandler. He just came out with an incredible dramatic role in The Mayor he's, with He's had some stinkers though. They both... The, uh, uh, Jim Carrey did what was the one with the kid, oh, the um, 13, what was the one with the uh, the murder? He was trying to, uh, uh, the number 13, what was that? I can't even remember. Who can remember these movies? But, oh, I'll find it, I'll find it. Yeah, they, they go, yes, they've had some good ones, but they've really had some sweet swings and misses. I mean, it you, you can't attack my movie and say, oh, it's a remake, we've no. seen it before. It can be great, and there's having a, Liam, always... Liam Neeson in there makes it gives it a to totally new, cool element to throw yes. in there. And Liam having the romance in another in there, action movie that's, that's no, as the awesome. villain in his swan song, as the and going up against the Rock. When have we seen a Liam Neeson versus the Rock? Liam Neeson is basically taking character versus Rock Thug Rock. This is fun. This is fun stuff. Your movie is a sappy drama that I've seen before with, that may not play. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. Movie making is a risk. It might not play. Your movie might exactly. not play. Your, there's there's yeah, a my yours. dozen movies like this. My point is, if you're going to swing, you you take the chance of missing. If you're going to swing, don't swing on something safe and fun and normal. Swing on something that's a risk. Swing on something that challenges these guys as actors, challenges us with our expectations, we, it's this is a movie that I think it it, it challenges them, but it's semi biographical for Dwayne Johnson to play an aging wrestler. I, I think he could tap into that very well. Uh, Kevin Hart as this guy who's had stumbles in his life and has decided to help other people. We see a sensitive side that we never have before. This is this is something that's worth taking a swing on. This You're is something yours is lost in the crowd of the sameness. Mine mine might have. Be dramatic and there's a bunch of dramatic movies out there sure that's that's okay i would rather have an original dramatic thing than another action comedy remake like 21 jump street or all the other ones to come out all right 21 jump street there, call time there <laughs> okay um i'm just finishing writing down this last note all right and we'll throw it over i believe isaac started this one yeah. so we're gonna put it back to isaac for closing arguments okay um, yes, <laughs> the, the things that he said in his argument where he's like, you want fun and you want something familiar, that's not what I want at all. I'm sick of fun and familiar. We just had a movie where, that was all about Marvel and we'll have one later and that's fine, but I'm sick of the Marvelization of movies where everything's a PG-13 action comedy. There's a, there's a woman in there that doesn't have a significant character. She's there as the romance that's kind of interesting. We have... Uh, 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 a familiar face to play the villain and everything works out in the end. A lot of laughs are head along the way and that's it. There's no depth. There's nothing to grab one to. Spring Butterfly is, is um, subverts expectations. It is inspiring to people to show that you, you can change. Dreams change. Don't be afraid of change. It examines midlife change crisis and this idea of masculinity um for an aged wrestler to realize that hey maybe it's time to embrace the arts like dwayne johnson did if we're going to take risks in movie making i don't want more remakes i don't want more fun safe action movies i want something different i want something new and i want something original i want spring butterfly all right definitely a strong fight so far but there's just a little bit left as we toss it over to jeremy for his closing all right, uh, I'm all for something risky. I'm all for taking The Rock and Kevin Hart and put, putting them into something risky. You didn't pitch anything risky, man. You, you pitched a warmed-over drama about two buddies that, 
you know, guy finds a new career. The other guy helps him a little bit. It's low key. It's 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 sappy. It's schmaltzy. And you know, my maybe they can pull off the drama, but I feel like they're going to be reaching. I feel like it's one of those movies that that comes out like in December, and it's like, oh, this guy can act. He's a dramatic actor. They're so forgettable. You say my movie is going to be forgettable. I've seen so many movies like yours that are forgettable. There isn't one thing that you pitch that's risky, that's really dramatic. That let's let's have The Rock do something actually risky. Let's have The Rock do something really daring in a movie that we really haven't seen. Like let's have him play uh, somebody with sexual addiction or so. I don't know. This your movie is safe and it's just as unoriginal as mine. At least I'm honest about it. I want I want a fun movie. I want a cool movie. And let me tell you something. This whole idea of movies needing to have depth is is I I'm sick of that because Jaws is a great movie that is an entertaining movie it, it it isn't this deep probing thing silver streak is a great movie from the 70s it's just a fun romp and my movie is a fun romp and my movie does have a great message to it it's the message of get out of your comfort zone take risks in life and and connect with different kinds of people you know if kevin hart saw rock's character on the street he would walk away from him and Vice, and then Rock would probably just try to like you know mug this guy. I mean, this these two people are going to connect. They're going to get to know each other. And you know, honestly, I haven't totally worked out the third act, but the female love interest is going to play in in a big way and be a big part of the story. And this love story is going to be really cool. And having Liam ne Neeson play this character in his last, like he's basically kind of spoofing and summarizing his whole take and uh, uh, the whole. Um, part of his career where he played these action roles. This is going to be kind of a cool, awesome, and yet kind of poignant thing. It's like, I can't do this anymore. I'm old. This is my, I'm going out on this one. And to see him play against The Rock in his last action role, to see The, the Rock kind of give him that respect, to see the two of them fight against each other, it's going to be fun. And there will be some poignant stuff, and there'll be some good messages, and there'll be some things. But at the same time, it's going to be entertaining. It's going to be fun. There's going to be some thrills, some action. Your movie, I, it's it, okay. It's another one of those low key dramas where the comedic guy tries to be dramatic. I'm not seeing any real riskiness there. I'm pitching something that's fun. And, and in a weird way, it kind of pays homage back to Gene Wilde and Richard Pryor, who were so great and so awesome. And to see, you know, the love that I think uh, Kevin Hart and The Rock would have, the reverence they would have for these two guys, and the way that they could try to capture their spirits in some ways and channel that. I think it would be a really cool thing, and I would love to see this movie. And remakes can be great. The thing is a remake. All right. Well, that was a fight. Um, uh, I will start off. Uh, there were a couple of movies that people couldn't quite get the names of. The Eddie Murphy movie was Mr. Church. That was 2016. Okay. I wanted to say, I wanted to say yep. Mr. Brooks, and I knew that was wrong. Mr. Church was the 2016. <laughs> and then Jim Carrey was yeah. the number 23. Number was 23, his, yes. 23, yeah. not 13. So just a little bit, I mean, not that that holds, like, a significant yeah. water in the argument, but fun fact-checking things. Um, <laughs> so what I found in this argument, you guys basically had the same arguments against one another. It was, oh, well, you're not pitching anything risky. Well, you're not pitching anything risky. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was the same back and forth. So, And I didn't really hear a lot more... Um, inventive things besides that uh, when it comes to when you're against each other. So as far as counterattacks against each other, I heard pretty much the exact same thing on both sides, just said in different ways a lot. So I'm going to pretty much take out all the attacks against one another. And then I think when it comes to supporting your own argument, I really loved what Jeremy was going with bringing on a director like Antoine Fuqua who can bring in some sort of comedic thriller vibes. I liked the idea of switching it all on its head and have Liam Neeson in a villain in his song, swan song role. I think... Um, hmm. I really liked that Isaac went with something creative and original and... Uh, even though we may have seen it before, it was still something that felt new for these two actors. Um, the one point that I think this one hinges on for me is that I think uh, Jeremy got a little bit lost when he was saying that, oh, it, 
movies don't need to have depth and of course they mm. don't you can just have a really nice awesome fun action comedy movie with some great movie stars but i think isaac's support for his own argument for why you know it is an inspiring story of change you know it's you can see a sensitive side of these characters it could be semi-autobiographical it examines masculinity it examines crisis i think the levels that isaac was saying it could go when it comes to depth uh trump the argument that jeremy had for just wanting a fun movie so once again by the slimmest of margins you guys are two of the best but this one I'm going to give to Isaac wow good match I wasn't <laughs> sure I, had, I didn't think I had that one <laughs> I don't know what to do with my life <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're doing good Robert you're doing good, you're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> this is by far so far the toughest match I've had to host yeah. now, I mean all of them are tough every single match I've ever hosted there are matches that are just so close but this one so far the first two you guys do not hold back All right, on to question three. So this is a really interesting one, actually. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how you guys are going to define this argument, but good luck trying. Uh, hmm. We wanted to ask for question three, what is the best movie of all the Alien and Predator franchise sequels, excluding Aliens? So excluding Aliens, what is the best sequel to an Alien or a Predator movie? I think we're back to Jeremy for opening arguments whenever you're ready. All right. Well, my personal opinion is if you look at the, the Alien franchise, um, obviously past Aliens, as we've excluded, I don't think any of the sequels work. I think they're all failures on different levels. Um, I, I think some of them are absolute betrayals of the Alien legacy. And, and yeah, there are some good things in some of the movies, but I, I really, there isn't one movie in that, in that whole series that I can really latch on to. You know, and, and, but, you know, and it's a bummer because Alien is such a great, you know, franchise. This is of Alien and Predator. Alien is the better franchise, really. So it's a shame that we've had movie after movie after movie fall short. So I can't go with any of those. I have to go to Predator, which, you know, to me isn't as, as strong of a franchise, but I'm looking at these individual sequels. And I think that 2010's Predators actually works. This is a sequel that is very true to the original film. It captures the spirit of the original film, and it is a solid sequel. It doesn't betray anything. It's fun. It's a good sequel, and it's not, you know, again, we're going to get into the ambition argument, but it's not ambitious like some of these alien movies. It's a let's make a cool, fun Predator movie, and it really works, and I think one of the great things is that they got Robert Rodriguez, who for me is an underrated uh, kind of genre kind of director like a b-movie director he is so good at doing like a fun b-movie like you can tell he's grown up loving b-movies of the 70s and 80s and he channels all of that if you look at something like from dusk till dawn or the spy kids movies or uh, one that i really think is underrated and really good is the faculty i really love that that teen alien movie he 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 knows how to do this stuff and he gets it with predators. Um, the second predator, you know, they tried to set it in LA in LA that didn't really work. It's let's put it back in the jungle, but we're going to do it on an alien planet and it's going to be a bunch of criminals and they're going to be stranded there. They're not going to know each other. We're not going to know what their past histories are. And they all of a sudden they're being hunted by a group of predators and they've got to find ways to work together to outsmart the predators. It's fun. And one thing that I, I really love about the movie is, Okay, are we going to get another Arnold Schwarzenegger? Are we going to get The Rock or somebody to try to recap what Arnold Schwarzenegger did? No, let's get Adrian Brody, the, the best actor winner from The Pianist. Let's have him be the Schwarzenegger thing. It sounds terrible, and it's awesome. I love Adrian Brody in this movie. Adrian Brody is a guy who, for whatever reason, has all the confidence in the world. He kissed Holly Berry like on the mouth when he won his best actor Oscar, this guy has cojones. And in this role, I believe him as this guy who isn't the biggest, isn't the most muscular, but this is a tough guy. This is a guy who's seen some shit in his life and he's ready to throw down with these predators and he is having so much fun playing this role. And it was a wonder, it was just a wonderful little touch that Rodriguez put in there. It's a fun movie, doesn't take itself too seriously and it's very true to the spirit of Predator in a way that no Alien sequel is. Alrighty, for sure, for sure. Predator is a great pick on that one, uh, given the choices. Uh, we'll toss it over to Isaac for your opening argument. Isaac, what you got? Okay, well, starting off, butting heads because <laughs> he said uh, none of the none of the uh, alien sequels live up to uh, the magic. Uh, au contraire, mon frere. Uh, <laughs> alien Three is a misunderstood masterpiece. 
Alien Three is is better than any Predator movie, and ever bar bar none. Uh, it's better than anything that happened after Aliens, and I almost want to say it's better than Alien. Uh, talk about not true to the original. Uh, it's not true to the original. This is what Alien Three brought the franchise back to the original. It brought it back to its horror roots. David Fincher brought uh, this atmosphere, this fear. The the directing is is fearful. You are tense that whole movie. I actually watched this movie again tonight to gear up for this movie to this for this argument. I watched it uh, about five hours ago, and I forgot how tense that movie is. It's it's a good good movie it does things that most sequels wouldn't this movie couldn't get made today with what it does with these characters and uh, it's it should be applauded for that uh predators there's there's a, a new location um but it feels a lot of the same it's the jungle it feels like the first one uh, adrian birdie as schwarzenegger you may personally like him as as the schwarzenegger great. character <laughs> so he great. terrible as the schwarzenegger <laughs> stand-in he's not an action star he never has been. He never will be. This was a terrible experiment. It was it was a risky try, and I applaud them for trying, but it fell flat. He's not an action star. Alien 3 is a better film. Uh, Predators is a fun uh, B-movie, as you said. Alien 3 is a movie that got derided because it wasn't Aliens when it is a misunderstood masterpiece. All righty, definitely two two good picks here. Arguably the two best picks that could have been made for this argument. Um, we will head into open form as soon as I have the clock ready because I'm unprepared. We're good. All right, so whenever you guys start talking, I will start the clock. Isaac, what are you smoking? This is one of the <laughs> this is one of the most hated sequels of all time. Of all the ones you could have picked, thank you for picking this one. This movie is hated and for good reason. For one thing, how does this movie start? It starts by killing Newt and Hicks, the two characters that we fell in love with in the previous movie. And, oh, you're going to tell me, oh, that was such a brave thing to do. No, that was a fuck you. It was a fuck you to the audience. It was, we don't give a shit. And we're going to do it. We're going to take the story that's been building in these first two movies. Alien and Aliens built on each other. What, what, what Ripley went through in that first movie built into the second movie. Yeah, they're different movies because the second one is an action film. But it was building the arc of this character, her becoming a mother again. She lost her daughter. She becomes a mother. All of this stuff is building into this great film when she battles that, that queen at the end. And then, oh, no, they died off screen. It's such a fuck you. And it's so hard to enjoy that movie from that point on. And then that movie is, it's glum. It's, it's depressing. It's the, I mean, what is there that's new in it? I mean, the, the special like effects. Sounds like talking about a Fincher the, movie. <laughs> yeah, the special effects are a little better than the previous films, but it's really the same alien stuff that we've seen. It doesn't innovate the way the aliens did. It's just the one alien attacking a bunch of boring uh, guys uh, on a prison colony that we don't care about. One of those characters, they're not fun. This movie is not fun, and Ripley isn't fun in this movie. Ripley's beaten down. She's not the Ripley that we know. There's no arc carried over. You can't get invested in her character. You can't get invested in anything that's going on. This this is a slog. I mean, I don't know what movie you're watching. I watch oh, my this movie. gosh. I watch this movie, and I want to <laughs> turn it off every fucking second. It's a grudge. I am so triggered right now. We're and back the to the end, same argument about and the the end um, of this movie is again it's like oh my god really you're gonna do that to ripley it's yes it, it, it betrays everything no it and doesn't y yes it does dude and let me tell you something you're gonna tell me it's a great david fincher movie it's, a, it's such a great david fincher hates that movie he tried to take his name off of it they the, the studio completely fucked him every second of the way making that movie it was not his movie let me tell you about a guy named robert rodriguez he made the movie he wanted to make he made it out of his own independent studio this is he works in independently he's an independent filmmaker making the movies he wants to make and he exactly. made the movie george he wanted to make george rodriguez had all the freedom in the world and all he could come up with was an average movie david fincher had a studio screwing him over every step of the way and he still made a masterpiece it still came out the other side the stu the, the theatrical release is great i love the theatrical release if we're going to talk about the extended cut i think that's just as good if not better um but no 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 okay Cliche. We want to talk about cliche cardboard characters. That's what happens in Predators. They're fun. boring. Boring. Just because my, people my characters talk are in my fun. movie doesn't make it boring. Because we we stripped it down to its roots. Innovative. We took away the guns. 
We took away everything that made aliens aliens. And, and look, we're back to the fun argument again, and I hate to keep bringing this up. This is one of the reasons that I don't like Aliens, because Alien is a great horror movie. Aliens is everything that James Cameron uh, uh, became. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a precursor to what happens when people take things and make them action uh, adventure films, okay? Bill Paxton and all those characters, rest in peace, everything else, uh, they make that movie what it, it, Alien should not be. Alien should be what Alien 3 is. This is not a happy story. Um, <laughs> this These are damaged characters. As far as, as, far as characters on the island, uh, Charles Dance's character is fantastic. All these characters, but they, they, they don't... I have more connection to Ripley, right? Ripley's the main character. You say that ending doesn't pay off and it and it disrespects her? You know what disrespects her? Her taking her stripping down to her underwear at the end of the first alien or her softening her in the in the second one with the, with the daughter. That is an F you to the audience because it's completely unexpected and it takes her back to this hollow place of this person doesn't get to have, have a happy ending. She says in the movie, you've been in my life so long, I can't remember anything else of the alien. That is what I want in this movie. It strips it down, okay. takes it back to the horror roots. It explores gender dynamics in this prison, uh, all of men. It has uh, incredible acting. This movie is so much better than Predators. It's, it's staggering that this argument happens. No, no, no. Now, you may not like Aliens. You may have your own little hipster ideas about it, but Aliens is one of the greatest action sci-fi movies ever made. And even though it's a different type of movie than Alien, it is very... It builds on Alien. It takes the, the character that we knew in Alien, this woman who is trying to do the right thing, make the right decisions in a horrible situation. It, it, it builds on that character. It shows her as a mother. It shows her as a person that connects to other people. And it builds the story that we connect to. Alien 3, she's not... It, it's, it's really abrupt. It just... The people that we liked from the last movie are dead, and now she's on this prison colony. I mean, I, I, the, none of the... All right. It's all right. You're you're gonna be going second, I think. Right. For close. Yep. Yes. Yep. So you should still have time to make the points you need to make. Okay. Um. Oh wait, no. You'll be going first, won't you? Yep. You'll be going no, first. Y- yeah. Okay. Yes, I go yep. first. Yep. All right. So Jeremy, go ahead and go with your close. Okay. All right. Alien Three. You may say it has great acting, and you may say that you like it, and that it's more true to the spirit of Aliens. But many fans don't did not have that experience. I didn't have that experience. I was thirteen when that movie came out. Aliens changed my life as a young man, and I was excited to see Alien Three. It was one of the most depressing experiences that I've ever had. It made Ellen this character that we no longer connected to, and we didn't get the arc. You're saying that oh, this this was a great portrayal of her character. We didn't build to this. This came out of nowhere, it, and David Fincher, he was handed this movie. He did what he could, but he hates the movie. It was not, he was not allowed to make his vision, and it really does play in the movie. I don't think any of these characters really stand out. I, the movie is not, it, it really isn't build anything new other than being dark and grim and depressing. Look, my movie, Robert Rodriguez, he, he knows how to make a fun B-movie, and he made that. And it's, this is what Predator was. It's a great sequel. It's the best sequel of any of these movies because it is true to the spirit of the original Predator. It is true to Arnold Schwarzenegger in the jungle doing everything that he did. And I love the little touches that Robert Rodriguez puts in there with Latino characters like Alice Braga, how he, he has those, those symbols in there for people from his culture. The, everything, he brings fun things and... There's twists in this movie that the humans are turning on each other just as the predators are killing them. It's a fun B movie, and it's true to that. Alien is a dark, glum movie that I don't care about. That is the one movie that I have the hardest time getting through in that entire franchise. And it, like every Alien sequel, including that one, is just, it doesn't know how to be a sequel to Alien. It tries to do something else. It doesn't work. The director himself hated it, didn't like the movie. Seven was his, his redemption. Seven was his way to make a movie where he could have his own vision and tell the story he wanted to tell. Alien was, he didn't know what he was doing on that movie. It's, it's a terrible sequel. And it, that opening with killing those characters off screen, you know, I can see you there, you know, Isaac, you're, you're a little like off on your own island enjoying it and thinking it was novel and all this stuff. But this was a fuck you to the fans. That whole movie is a fuck you to the fans. It's, it's a betrayal. And it's not a fun movie. It's not a good, it's not what Alien was. Alien was not a dark fuck you. Alien was a good, entertaining horror movie. And Aliens is a great horror action film. And ter- that's a terrible sequel. 
All right, an extremely passionate uh, closing from Jeremy. I expect no less than an extremely passionate from Isaac as well. Uh, Isaac, what you got for a closing? Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, taking notes and... Uh... No, I totally understand. I, I have two pages full, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Predator. First, I, I, I don't even know where to start here. Okay, first, we'll, I'll start with Predator, okay? Um, none, no characters stand out in my movie. No characters stand out in your movie. We haven't even talked about your movie uh, very much. Um, Lawrence Fishburne. Every time that movie cuts away to Lawrence Fishburne in his stupid little place, it drags the movie to a dead halt. Your movie took a great idea. I like the idea of Predators. They took them to the Predator's planet and then did nothing with it. They did nothing with it. It be, it was the first movie again on a different planet, and, and nothing changed. Uh, okay, now <laughs> on to Alien Three. Okay, first off, I'm not alone in this. Alien Three has become a cult classic because people have looked beyond their own expectations. It's it it feels like an f you because of what you expect coming off of Alien Aliens. Um. Look beyond what your expectations were and look at what Alien 3 is. It is new. It is fresh. The twists that happened in that movie with, with uh, um, uh, Ripley being the one with the impregnant, that is something new. We didn't do nothing in our, third, in our sequel. We did something new. In, as far as comparing to the other Alien movie, I know this isn't part of the question, but in the first Alien, she survives because she's lucky for the most part. Um, in Aliens... It, she survives mainly because she has a whole barrage of people there helping her. Alien 3, she is stripped down with, with, with nothing but her wits. They don't have guns. They don't have anything. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a reductive movie. It takes it down to its bare elements. It makes the aliens scary again, not just cannon fodder like aliens. It makes them actual, legit threats, unlike aliens. Um, and... I, I just want to make this comparison because I think it's accurate. People talk about how dour it is. Yes, it's a dour movie. That's okay. It gives an end to a tra ca chapter. It gives an end to a character that we love. A glorious end where she saves humanity for her sacrifice. Uh, there's no other sequel that has that has done that. Oh, wait. There is one. It's called Logan. It came out this year. And compared to Alien 3, Logan is a picnic in the park. Alien 3... I th it is is the Logan of the Alien franchise. Predators is a barely okay afternoon. All right, out of the fight so far, this has definitely been the most passionate. I think you guys both bring a lot of emotion and passion to your arguments, which is good. I a passionate fighter is a strong fighter, in my opinion. Um, not that it's the be all end all, but I am gonna pull some Rotten Tomatoes numbers out here just as a small guide because there were you guys were talking about how much uh, audiences and other people did or didn't like the movie. So right now, Alien 3, as far as a critic score on the tomato meter, is sitting at a 46 with an audience score of 47. And Predators is sitting at a tomato meter critic score of 64 and an audience score of 51. So not that that's the be-all end-all, but in those categories, as far as arguments are concerned, Predators is leading on both audiences and critics. Uh, as for this argument, I mean, it was a clean argument. There were no... You guys weren't spouting lies or anything like that, uh, like factually at least. Um, it's this is a really interesting argument for sure. Um, you know, Jeremy was talking a lot about how Alien Three is dark and grim and depressing. You can't get invested in the story. You can't get invested in the characters. How Fincher hates the movie. The ending doesn't pay off for the character. Uh, and then Isaac was talking about how it's more cliche and cardboard characters, and how Fishburne's character really brings the movie down. Uh, Jeremy made a lot of great points about Robert Rodriguez and his style in directing the movie. Um, where I think I am making my ruling on this one is I think Isaac got a little bit caught up in his main argument during the main body. I think, Isaac, you were talking a lot about how Alien 3 is better than Aliens, and you even said it yourself in your closing. We haven't talked about Predators that much yet. Uh, I think I needed to hear more points against Predators in the main argument. Yes, you brought up a lot of good points in the closing, but at that point, Jeremy didn't have any opportunity to rebut them. So I think in the main round, I needed more against Predators. But yeah, once again, 
by that close of margin. And I don't know that I personally agree with that ruling too much. I don't love Alien 3, but I also don't hate it. Um, so I'm going to give this one to Jeremy. Wow, I really thought I didn't get that one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's kind of like on the last one, Isaac. <laughs> yeah. I thought you loved <laughs> <laughs> I just oh, need a little wow. bit. Yeah, I just think you got caught up even at the end yeah. talking about Logan. I need a little bit talking about aliens a little bit too much. I need a little bit more in the main round. Although yeah. I do agree that, that was it does. A tough, it is reductive. It that was does a tough one because scary. as much as Isaac loves that movie, I hate that movie. So yeah. Yeah. I think we're getting a little steamed up. Wait, wait. I, I really like that movie. Wait, say it again. I really I, hate that movie. I couldn't I sell. Saying... I couldn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't sell at all. I'm as red as a freaking. I'm as red as Spider Man here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, convenient. Um, segue. <laughs> so, that definitely uh, helped ooh. me because I was like, I, I couldn't care less much about predators, but I did. I know. Care about yeah. I definitely, aliens, so. <laughs> in Jeremy's opening, yeah. he definitely. I thought you. Gonna, I thought you were gonna go Covenant, man. <laughs> I did not oh, know you were gonna pull inside. Oh, I would have gone Covenant. Through. It would have gone Covenant. Would it? How did oh, it yeah. count? It was. It's not a sequel. It's in the yeah, franchise. I, I would have counted. That, I yeah, mean, I, that's that's the tricky thing. Yeah, I'm not yeah. the one who accepted these answers. But uh, if I yeah. was the one accepting these answers, I would have accepted Covenant. Yeah, it's tricky. All right. <laughs> Alien Three is better than Covenant. <clears throat> I haven't seen Covenant. That's why I was worried. <laughs> All right. Should have so picked Covenant. <laughs> Jeremy is <laughs> so we're going into the fourth question of the main round before we hit the speed round. Jeremy is leading Isaac two to one, so it's still definitely anybody's game. Uh, this next question is a really interesting one. Um, we're going to let Isaac go first with opening arguments as we ask, which character excites you the most to see in Avengers Infinity War? So it's a little bit of a subjective question, but I still want to see lots of facts, lots of points, proving why. So what character are you most excited to see in Infinity War? Isaac, whenever you're ready. Thanos. Like, is there another answer to the question? I guess there is, but like, how is there? There's one thing that this whole universe has been leading up to, and it's Thanos. Like, I, I don't even think of this as like Avengers Infinity War. I think of this as Thanos. Just the movie, Fa like, no. There's no other question. The, the story of, of, of Avengers Infinity War doesn't have me excited. The other characters, the Avengers themselves, I could care less about. The only thing I want to see is Thanos getting on Earth and kicking their butts. That's all I have. Like, Thanos is such the easy pull here. I don't... Thanos is the character. All right, definitely uh, an unorthodox argument, but I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue that it's an incorrect one. Um, I also just wrote down Thanos colon the movie uh, <laughs> in my notes, so uh, we're gonna pass it over to Jeremy for perhaps another unorthodox pick. Maybe. Um, here's the thing: we've been building and building and building with these Avengers movies. It's gotten to the point where there are these big BMF productions and we're going to go in and see all of the action all of the special effects they're getting bigger and bigger more and more characters more 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 and that's great i mean that is what we go to see in, in summer movies but god damn it i want to care i don't want to just get lost in all of the fighting and the battles and the space and the, all this shit i want to be connected with what's going on that is when the when these movies are at their best like Doctor Strange, when we, we get invested in that guy's journey, how he's an asshole and he changes. Like Tony Stark's journey in the first movie. I want to be invested and I want to care. And who's the one character right now in this series that I care about, that I want to see? I want to see how he's going to grow. I want to see how he's going to become a hero, how he's going to find his voice. That character is this guy, Spider-Man. Spider-Man is the guy that I care about. He's the one that I'm following. He is the most human character. He's just a kid. He's just a kid who's trying to figure things out. And all of a sudden, it's the end of the goddamn universe. And this kid is there. And it's, it's going to be really awesome to see where we go from Homecoming. This character is at the start of their journey. And to see how he's going to factor in, I'm really excited. And every time that we see him and, and how he connects to Tony and how he connects to the other characters, 
I, I think there's an opportunity to be emotionally connected. There's an opportunity to have that, that human touch. And, you know, one of the things that they held back on in Spider-Man Homecoming was the spider sense thing. Like, that is a cool thing from the comics. And people are like, well, what about a spider sense? What about that? Well, they hint at it in the trailer. The, the, the uh, hairs go up on his arm. It's a wonderful little touch to show us, yes, we're still building this character. We're giving you all the stuff that you know from his history. And he's going to play into this. And then we see him in this, this new suit, this I, per, perhaps Iron Spider suit, fighting. That's going to be awesome to see. But at the same time, he's this kid that I'm connected to. And let me tell you something. When I was a kid, there were three things that I loved. Superman, Batman, and Spider-Man. I ran around, hung off the walls like Spider-Man. That was me living out my little fantasies in my little apartment in California here. And that is always something that I connect to in these movies is that little kid who wants to be Spider-Man. And that is something deeper and more emotional than any of this big cataclysmic BS. Alrighty, definitely two opposite sides of the same coin, I would say, on this argument. Uh, we're going to go into the main round, the open forum round. Whoever starts talking first, that's when I'll hit start. Oh, I, I don't even know where to start on this one because I, 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 I'm one of the few people in this world, and I, I don't know. Spider-Man Homecoming didn't do it for me. It just didn't. He doesn't work. Uh, as a character, like I don't understand who this kid is. I I love Spider Man. He was the guy who got me into comic books, and this just doesn't feel like Spider Man to me. This feels like Tony Stark, like cloned as a kid. Like it just doesn't feel like Spider Man. You said he shows up in the Iron Spider suit uh, in the trailer, which yeah, it looks cool. But at that point, to me, he's just another Iron Man stand-in. Um, and, and the key thing is, you said, like, here's this kid dealing with all this end-of-the-world stuff. Yes, the end-of-the-world stuff, Thanos. It's still about how he relates to Thanos. Uh, this character, the one part that... that I'm not a huge fan of the MCU. I'll, I'll admit that. But the mm -hmm. one part that everyone can agree on with the MCU is that they have a villain problem. They, they have a hard time having compelling villains. Exactly. This is a villain that they've been building up since 2012. We've been getting little glimpses of him, and he <laughs> looks like the first real threat. I've never felt a sense of da danger in any of these movies uh, by any of the villains. Just the trailer had me thinking, this guy is the real deal. He is going to screw people up. This is the guy I cannot wait to see come to Earth. All right. Well, you, get, you gave us your point of view. Let me give you mine. Spider-Man Homecoming was the first time I really felt connected to that character in any big screen adaptation. This was an actual young actor, not 95-year-old Tobey Maguire. This was an actor that I felt connected to. He was, he was awkward. He had, he had trouble, you know, connecting with other people. This is every, he was basically me in high school. I completely connected to Tom Holland's portrayal. I think a lot of people really were touched by that portrayal. It was, it was true to who Peter Parker is in the comics. It was the first time we got the true Peter Parker from the comics. This kid who's just thrown into this thing. And no, he's not Tony Stark Jr. He, he, there's no way he's going to end up like Tony Stark. He's got his own journey, and he and Tony are going to end up clashing. They already are. This is, this is a kid that I'm connected to and that I care about. Now, let's talk about Thanos, goddammit. Every one of these superhero movies has the big computer CGI character who just shows up out of nowhere and starts bashing people. And this is supposed to be the villain. Look, you may know Thanos from the comics. You may have been following Thanos for years, but I, I don't know who he is. He, he's shown up in a few movies. He said some things. He's got a big purple face. I don't know who the hell he is. I don't know what he's going to do. We've got people talking about him, but he hasn't done anything. And what does he do in this trailer? He's a big CGI effect that's bashing people. I just saw that. That was uh, Steppenwolf. I just saw Steppenwolf bashing people. I saw other CGI characters bashing people. Why do I care? This is just a big CGI villain who's just doing bashing stuff. Like, yeah, it's going to be cool to watch. There'll be some cool special effects, but I don't care. I'm sick of the CGI crap. I want to see a teenager thrown into these situations, a teenager that I connect to and go, and yes, I will only care about what's going on with Thanos if I have a character that I feel attached to having to deal with Thanos. If I just see Champ Thanos with a scepter bashing people, I don't give a shit. I need to have that hero to connect me to any of that. 
I don't. I, I really just don't understand. I, I guess it comes from this place of we've had some bad CGI villains, but I don't understand why CGI is a part of this argument against CGI villains. Like some of the best villains ever were CGI. That shouldn't be a part of anything. Um, as far as just bashing stuff, he's not just bashing stuff. He's ripping Infinity Stones out of people's heads. He's he's. <laughs> It's that... kind of cool, but he's throwing... Okay, pull the stone out of the head. Uh, yeah, that's kind of cool to look at, but I, I'm i sorry. I like stories. I like dramatic storytelling. I like characters. I like, you know, and this is a character who's at the beginning of their journey. We've got a lot of other heroes that are at the end of their journeys. Tony Stark's story is ending. Captain America's story is ending. We've got Spider-Man starting his story, and this is an exciting thread that's going to run through this movie that's going to make it more human. I, I, okay, he pulls that's a exciting. stone out of someone's head. You just said what excites me, okay? Spider-Man's at the beginning of the journey. You're right. This is part of the beginning of his journey. What excites me is what's next after Infinity War. We already know the next movie is going to be a Spider-Man movie, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Captain America's at the end of his journey. Iron Man is at the end of his journey. That's exciting because we're connected to these characters. I'm not connected to Spider-Man yet. I will be after he sees these people who brought him into this get killed. And, and he time there, time one. there. That's exciting. Time there, alrighty. So definitely, uh, I mean, two fantastic picks. You could argue for fifty characters for this oh, movie yeah. for sure. There, are, you guys have some great arguments coming up. I'm excited to see how your closings end up. So Isaac, we'll just start with you closing arguments. Okay, like I just said, what's exciting for Spider-Man is what comes after Thanos, and we got to deal with Thanos first. What he does to the Avengers around him, how that changes Spider-Man, how that changes Peter Parker as a person. That is exciting. But Peter Parker in this movie doesn't excite me. What happens after Thanos, that's exciting for Peter Parker. In this movie, we look like we're going to have our first dangerous villain. I've never felt danger in a Marvel movie, and I feel danger coming with this guy. Thanos, uh, I, I'm expecting deaths. Um, that's never happened in a Marvel movie. That's something new. Uh, I've seen characters grow before. Um, I've never seen a character have to deal with the death of a mentor like Peter Parker will have to probably deal with the death of an Iron Man. Um, this feels like the first real threat as far as Thanos goes. Um, CGI isn't a negative if they do it right, and it looks like they're doing it very right. Uh, if the MCU is the solar system, Thanos is the sun, and everything else has been revolving around him for how many movies now? Uh, I want to see what happens when he comes to Earth and, and starts messing things up. Thanos, if you're not excited for, if you're excited for Infinity War for any other reason than Thanos, then I, I feel like I, I don't understand what movies you've been watching. All right, definitely a good argument there by Isaac, and we'll pass it over to Jeremy to wrap things up for the main round of questions. All right. Well, everything that Isaac just said really doesn't talk about Thanos as a character. This is all about, okay, Thanos is this threat that's going to come in. Characters are going to die. This is all story stuff. This is the story is going to involve characters dying. And he said it himself. Spider-Man is going to be changed by all of this. Well, yeah, we care about Spider-Man being changed by all of this. But who is Thanos as a character? We don't know anything. I mean, I don't know who this guy is. And let me tell you why the CGI is a negative because it takes you away from it as a character. It's, yes, it's, it's this creature, and he's doing physical acts, and there's action, but I don't feel connected as a character. Let me give you an example. Vision in Avengers Age of Ultron, there was a lot of special effects involved with that character, and it put me at a little bit of a distance from him. I didn't feel as connected to him as a character. Well, in this trailer, we see Vision, the, we see Paul Bettany, the, a human version of him. I have theories about why we see that, but we're going to see that. And in that one little instance of seeing that actor with Elizabeth Olsen standing there, I felt more connected. When you see an actor and you see a character, and it's not an effect, and it's not covered up in the, with effects... I just, I feel more connected to that. I'm connected to the story. And it's like, you're basically building up a big action guy who's going to do action things. And it's like, we have a lot of action stuff already. I want the human stuff. This is the stuff that it, if that isn't there, 
this is going to be so disappointing. I mean, yeah, I mean, Justice League had some great uh, visual effects and some great effects. A lot of movies do. We've gotten that before. That's not what I'm excited for. What I'm excited for is the 12 movies building up to this, building these characters, building these stories, building these relationships, how this is all going to play together. And what happens with Spider-Man, what happens with Peter Parker in this movie is going to be really important and really key. And yes, it is going to pay off in previous films because of who he is and what he's done and this character and not what some big CGI monster does. And it, it's like with Thanos, like you keep saying, we haven't had a good villain. We haven't had a good villain. Exactly. We haven't had a good villain in the MCU. They fail every time. So what makes us think they're going to do it this time? Just because they talked about him for five movies doesn't mean he's going to be good. It's probably just going to be another zero, another CGI villain like we've had a million times before. Marvel does not have a good track record with this. And I haven't seen anything in the previous movies. I haven't seen anything in post credit scenes. I didn't see anything in that trailer that was new that made me think they're doing it this time. No, I saw more of the same. Is it a little better effects? Is it a little cooler? Sure, but we got enough cool. We need the human. And Thanos, I don't give a shit. All right, and we'll call it there. That's the... Oh, damn. Um... All right, well, give me just one quick second here to go over my notes. Um... I mean, both of you guys are obviously extremely passionate about this argument. Obviously, two fantastic choices. Um, I loved what Jeremy was saying about, you know, Spider-Man's a kid going through all this cosmic shit. All of a sudden, the world is ending. Like, you want to see a, a character that you connect with deal with that. You want to see that character's story being told uh, through all of these things. Uh, for Isaac, you know, it's, it is this... The, we could see the greatest villain, you know, the CGI may not matter, you know, we're expecting Thanos to kill people, we're expecting him to rip stones out of people's heads. Um, it, the whole universe has been built into this, built into this, built into this, and that's why we're excited for the character. Um, I think the one point that hit it for me, I, I was back and forth this entire match. I, every single sentence I was flip-flopping between who I was going to... That's not a joke. Every single sentence I was flip-flopping between who I was going to go with. Um, or who I thought was leading, not who I thought was going to go with. Um, and I think the one point that hit at home is when Isaac said, I'm not excited for what happens here with Spider-Man. I'm excited for what happens in the next film and the next film and the next film. Uh, you're, you're obviously interested in seeing how the Spider-Man arc pays off, but I think Isaac hit the nail on the head as far as that arc isn't paying off in this movie. It's going to pay off in following installments where Jeremy, I mean, you definitely had big hits. The CGI monster may take you out of the character, but Isaac definitely made a good point of how the universe has been built into this, and that's why I'm excited for this movie. So, but slim wow. margins, yeah, yes, you got two are incredible. <laughs> Sorry, I, I let you down, buddy. I, I I didn't think I won that. I can show you. I already moved onto my speed round page, and I and I wrote that you won that argument because I was like, I'm not winning that one. <laughs> That's how Jeremy's, I told him the last one. <laughs> Jeremy's closing was fantastic. Um, I really like Jeremy's closing, but I think he hindered a little bit too much on the CGI during the main round. Right. But either way. Um, what a bitch. I'm glad I'm not facing against either one of you, to be honest. <laughs> uh, extremely intimidating, guys. All right. So as far as speed round goes... um. We're changing to a little bit of a different format. We're trying to give you guys a little bit more time because the speed round has seemed a little bit rushed. Um, so we're going to give you guys 30 seconds um, to answer in the first round. So 30 seconds, 30 seconds, then we're going to go 15, 15. So instead of like a 20 and 10 or something like that. And then if it comes down to the final question, uh, we'll go 30, 30, 15, 15, and then an additional 10 for each of you to really okay. hammer those final ones in. Okay. Right. So that's if it comes down to a final question. All right. So here is the first question. Uh, this is a little bit more open-ended, so keep in mind, whoever shouts their answer first both has to argue first and gets that answer. So what is the best movie in the Planet of the Apes franchise? Don't more, Planet of the Apes. More for the Planet of the Apes. Did you both say war? I think you both said war. I said war, and then he. Yeah, I said war, and then he said dawn. I was first. Oh, I, I, I thought Isaac said war. Isaac, you no. said dawn. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Isaac for dawn. Jeremy for war. 
All right, so Jeremy, you were first then. Let me get the clock ready. You have 30 seconds. I'm going to try to move my hand as fast as your mouth can move. Uh, anytime when you're ready, man. I actually just saw this movie for the first time this week. I was a little late in coming to it, and I'm still feeling the effects of it. There's few movies in my life that affected me the way that War for the Planet of the Apes did. To see this character, Caesar, that built up in these first two films come to this last and face a foe like he's never faced before, and Woody Harrelson is the colonel who kills his family, who takes all of his people and slaves them. It's the story of Moses. It's the story of the end of the world. It's the story of the building of a new world, and it's the story of this character that can't enter into the promised land at the end he's done all of these great things but he's at the end now and uh it's it's just it's an amazing film and andy circus's performance has just built to this operatic amazing powerful level this is the opposite of everything i was saying before i care about a cg character because you see the humanity in his eyes the special effects really uh they showcase his acting and to show him his loss his tragedy oh, and his tragedy shoot. in himself wow. time 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 i was too busy writing and gave you way too much time there. Oh, sorry. Um, no, it's not your fault. You kept talking. I gave you 53 seconds. So uh -oh. by principle, I have to do the same thing to Isaac. No uh, I will keep a closer eye on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got lost in your words and my pen. All right, go ahead. Uh, Isaac, whenever you're ready. Okay, War for the Planet of the Apes is a great, great movie. There's not a bad... Uh, Planet of the Apes movie as far as the new trilogy goes. There's not. I personally think Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is absolutely the best Planet of the Apes. It's the most character-centric movie. It's the most... It's the it's the movie with the most layered characters. It's the movie with the most character development. Um, it's the most emotional movie for me. Um, the dynamics between Koba and Caesar are... are it's, a, it's a relationship in a film that is never... I've never seen before. And I think it should go down in history as one of the greatest uh, sagas ever ever made. My movie plays like a Shakespearean tragedy. Yours plays more like a revenge western where the main character dies at the end. It it it's it feels a little bit more familiar than what and we do there. in Dawn. Okay. Uh... All right, this time I am actually going to give you the 15 seconds, so don't don't be prepared to go too far mm. over. That was my fault in the first one. Jeremy, right. whenever you're ready. Donald the Planet of the Apes is a traditional good guy, bad guy story with Caesar as the good guy who has to rise up against his cohort, Koba, and do the heroic thing at the end. War is a story of he, yes, he has a villain in Woody Harrelson, but really he's realizing his own evils, his own flaws, his own uh, lack as a person. It's awesome. Let me finish writing. All right, and Isaac, for your final 15 seconds. Okay. Woody Harrelson is just a rehash of Gary Oldman in Dawn, a better movie. Gary Oldman did it first. He did it better. Um, I don't care about the human characters in this movie, and that's one of the reasons that Woody Harrelson doesn't matter. Koba and Caesar, what they do with the apes in that relationship, it's not good guy, bad guy. There are no good guys, bad guys. That's what makes this movie so interesting. It's not a fan. Whew. This is one of my favorite questions ever. I love this question yeah. um, because there are so many ways you can go with it. Um, man, once again, I apologize for letting you go so far over time, but you guys all had both had amazing, amazing, amazing points. Um, while I don't necessarily agree with all of his points, I think Isaac had more hits against war than Jeremy had against Dawn. Especially in that closing there, the those last 15 seconds, how it's it's just a rehash of Oldman. You don't care about the human characters. It's not good guy, bad guy. That's what makes it so interesting is it's it's so conflicting on a character level. I think that that gave the point to Isaac for me on that one. But Jeremy's still extremely well thought. I, I'm glad that you did come around and see this movie eventually because it's one yeah. of the best of the year. It's so good. So Isaac is going to go up two to three. And Jeremy's going to hope to bounce back here with... Which one should we do? This will be an interesting one for you guys to fight. All right, once again, it's a little open-ended, so once you think of an answer, feel free to say it. Okay. Who is the most underrated director actively working today?
A little bit of a tough one. I can give you a new question if you like. Uh, uh, Jeff Nichols. David Gordon Green. Uh, what'd you say, Jeremy? David Gordon Green. One second. I'm just making sure that they're like can be considered actively working. There. Yep, I know. I'm just double checking. Alrighty. Both of those answers will be accepted. This is going to be a hell of an argument. Um, <clears throat> maybe a little bit of a, a little bit of a tougher question, one that makes you think a little bit more. But uh, Isaac, you answered first, so you'll go first with thirty seconds for real this time. <laughs> <clears throat> Jeff Nichols hasn't gotten the recognition that he deserves for what a great director he is. He tells human stories. He connects to characters. He, he there's a reason that. Um, that actors work with him again and again. He's told so many great stories with Shotgun Stories, Take Shelter, Mud, Midnight Special, Loving. He hasn't had a miss yet. He tells human stories that connect on an emotional level. He is uh, feels like a director from the 70s breaking out to be a new classic director a la Scorsese. He, um, and time there, time there. All righty, David Gordon Green for Jeremy whenever you're ready. We're talking about an underrated, underappreciated director, David O. Russell. I'm talking to David O. Russell. David Gordon Green is a tremendously underrated and underappreciated director. He did many. He's done so many movies in the last 15 years. He's done great indie movies. A movie that I love called All the Real Girls with Zoe Deschanel. Uh, uh, Snow Angels with Sam Rockwell, one of the most powerful dramas you ever see. But he can also do great comedy. He did Pineapple Express. He's done a lot of different types of movies. He has tremendous range. He did a wonderful movie called Prince Avalanche. So many movies. Such a body of work in such a time short period there. of time. I'm there. Alrighty. So you both have good points in. We're going 15 seconds back to Isaac. Make sure you uh, both are staying focused on the question and also make sure you get at least a couple points in against the other director. David Gordon Green is another Ron Howard. He's the director for hire. He tells good stories. He's not a bad director, but he just does his job. Jeff Nichols is innovative. He tells stories that are unique to him, unique to his perspective. You've never seen a movie like Mud or Midnight Special. He tells new Time. things. He's new. And Jeremy, when you're ready. His, op his first feature, George Washington and uh, Snow Angels, are two of the most unique, powerful movies you'll ever see. They are very new. Uh, Jeff Nichols' movies, yes, they're, they're a little... Uh, they're, they might seem new, but we've seen them before. We've seen Southern Gothic before. Uh, David Gordon Green's made so many great movies. Holy shit, guys. Um... Yeah, so you guys both, in your first 30 seconds for sure, both had excellent supports for your own arguments. Jeremy talking about how he's extremely underrated. He has such a body of work, a huge range as a director. Uh, Isaac talking about the true human stories, the characters. Uh, he hasn't really missed yet. He's innovative. He has new things. Um, hmm. I think on this one... This is tough, guys. This is this is tough. Um, I think Isaac's hits against Jeremy, saying he's another Ron Howard. He's just doing his job. I think Jeremy counteracted those extremely well, saying uh, that's not true. He is something new. He is innovative. He is unique and powerful films. Um, and again, going back to the body of work, I think the, the arguments against Jeremy's were counteracted in a manner that I'm going to give this point to Jeremy. And he's more underappreciated. 
Yes, that, that, that as well. I, I mean, Jeff Nichols is great, and he's has great movies, but I also agree, and you did say that in your opening as well, that yeah. uh, Jeff Nichols has had some recognition already. That was a strange question, uh, a strange round, and I am sweating sitting here watching you guys fight. Let me pull up. All right. So this one's for all the marbles. We are three and three right now. Definitely one of the hardest fought battles in movie battleground history. Um, once again, this time you're going to get 30 and then 15 and then an extra 10 to fight. So make sure you guys are really focusing in on the question, honing the argument for the question and attacking each other as such. All right. What actor is the best live action Batman? Ben Affleck. Christian Bale. Isaac for Ben oh, Affleck fuck. first. And Jeremy for Christian Bale. I would argue that these are the two best Batmen, if you will. Uh, Isaac, you're going to be up first for 30 seconds in just one second once my phone unlocks. And whenever you're ready, Isaac. Ben Affleck's Batman is the most comic book accurate Batman ever put to screen. He is the best on-screen Batman. He's got the best suit. He's got the best look. He's got the physicality. Um, <laughs> Christian Bale is a great Bruce Wayne. He's not a great Batman. He's he's no mocked world round for his stupid Batman voice. One of his lines in Dark Knight is, I'm not wearing hockey pads. What's funny is that his suit, it still looks like hockey pads. Ben Affleck's suit looks like a Batman suit. He's he brings the threat that you never felt with Christian Bale's Batman in the in the opening scene and of time, BBS. Time. Jeremy for Christian Bale. Batman Begins is the first time we actually got to know who Batman was. That movie built up this character. It told us what drove him. It told him why he chose everything that he chose to become this character. And Christian Bale embodied this character so great for three films. Not very many actors could have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Heath Ledger the way that he did. It was great acting. It was a great Batman. And they betrayed Batman and Batman v Superman by having him kill all these people. That's not who Batman is. Ben Affleck's Batman is a betrayal. Christian Bale told us who he was and was true to his character in a really wonderful and human way. Way. And time. Uh, let me write that last point down. Okay, Isaac, you have another 15, then you'll have another 10. Batman Begins can barely can be considered a Batman film. It's a Bruce Wayne film. That's why I said he's the best Bruce Wayne. It explains him as a character. It doesn't explain his Batman. It, it, he's not a good Batman. Batman v Superman doesn't betray anything except fanboys' expectations. That is the Dark Knight uh, time. Returns Batman. And Jeremy, you're 15. Batman Begins is him taking everything that he's going to take to become Batman. He becomes Batman in the movie. In The Dark Knight, he is Batman going up against his greatest foe. And at the end of The Dark Knight, he makes the ultimate sacrifice to become the villain in people's eyes. He, he is the ultimate character that we care about. Ben Affleck Time. is someone that kills people and doesn't care. Last 10 seconds for each of you guys. Um... Sorry, my hand can only move so fast. All right, Isaac, your last 10 seconds when you're ready. The best live action Batman scene? Let's go, let's go with the best live action Batman scene. I'll put the warehouse scene of Ben Affleck against, where's the trigger of, of, of Christian Bale? Christian Bale is not Batman. He's Bruce Wayne. And Jeremy. The bat pod chase in the Dark Knight is maybe the greatest action sequence in any superhero film. I don't, I'm not as, dr I don't care about what happens in BVS and him branding people and putting them in prison, in prison and being brutal Time. is not Batman to me. Have you read The Dark Knight Returns? That's one story and it's not. Well, not part of the argument. Not part of the Sorry. argument. Sorry. I'm just talking. I'm just talking. That's no, all right. Um, wow. All right. So. I think obviously tonight you guys have both proved why you are two of the best uh, that Move Battleground has ever seen. Um, 
both fantastic fighters. Uh, Isaac obviously opened up with he's, it's comic book accurate. The the suit, the look, the physicality, the threat. Jeremy comes back with uh, you really understand the embodiment. Uh, he went toe to toe with Heath Ledger as Batman. Uh, he took on the cow, made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, I really think you guys both, you know, putting the warehouse scene up against the bat pod scene is just unfair in my book. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think both embarrassment of, those, of riches, exactly. Embarrassment both, of riches, <laughs> exactly. Both of those scenes are perfect as far as Batman. He, he, he forced my hand there. He yeah, forced my hand. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. Um, yeah, he definitely. Yeah, oof. Um, I think. What comes down to me is the different ways that you attacked each other's arguments. Um, you know, Isaac was saying a lot how he's a good Bruce Wayne. Batman Begins is a Bruce Wayne movie. He's not Batman, he's Bruce Wayne. He's Bruce Wayne. Uh, Jeremy, I think, came out with uh, more than that one angle on to why Ben Affleck isn't the best Batman, saying you don't care when he kills people. He betrayed the character of Batman. Uh, as far as the branding and imprisoning people, that's not what you look for in the character. Um, and I think the coming out of the different angles, I think I got to give this one to Jeremy, but extremely, extremely well thought. Um, I'm going to go take well, a two at least, <laughs> at least I did this guy well. I failed this guy, and I didn't fail that guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so an end score here of 4-3. I mean, guys, I'm sure everybody watching this will be looking to see both of you in the ring very, very soon. Uh, obviously, both of you have proven that you're two of the best that we've ever seen. Um, some great questions, some great fights, some great arguments, some great pitches, some weird moments, uh, some passion-filled fights, for sure. Some um, red faces. Some very, oh yeah, some red faces all around the table. Um, Isaac, if you want to start, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me at Filmer2013 on Twitter or uh, Isaac Corvett on YouTube. Awesome, awesome. And I'm sure, like I said, we'll see you in the ring very soon again. Nobody can deny that you are a top contender in this league. Nobody can You're deny amazing. That You're amazing, Isaac. <laughs> yeah. You're awesome, dude. You are too. Nobody can deny that. Nobody can take a single thing away from you. Uh, and Jeremy, where can we find you? I am one of the uh, admins at Full Metal Trivia, the fairly new uh, trivia uh, contest where it's one player to rule them all. We battle it out, and we are also part of the new Worldwide uh, Movie Games Network, which also has the There Will Be Trivia with Chris Doman and Henry Sanchez run, which I am the head crush and writer. So wherever there's good movie trivia going on in the fan leagues, you'll probably see me there. So Awesome, awesome. And as always, my name is Robert Parker. I am. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Letterbox at rbrtprkr98. It's my first and last name with no vowels, plus a year. Uh, so you can find me on those places. You can find me hosting matches here on Movie Battleground. I am one of the admins here. Um, we all have a great time hosting these matches. And as of late, I'm not sure exactly when this will be posted, but we are housed now under the also, as well as Full Metal yes. Trivia, under mm -hmm. the Worldwide Movie Games Network. Yes. So you can make sure you go subscribe to that channel. Sometime soon, we'll be moving uh, a good chunk of our content over there. So make sure you guys like and comment on this video. Give these guys some love in the comments. These are some of the best fighters we've <sighs> ever seen. This is one of the best matches we've ever seen. I want you guys to check this out for sure. Uh, on behalf of everybody here at Movie Battleground, all of the admins, all of the question writers, on behalf of these fighters, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Make sure you like and share this video. And as always, we'll see you next time. Thanks.